In Creole Parametric, there are different strategies that you can take towards the design of assemblies, and they have their different uses and their pros and their cons. In this video, we will take a look at five of them. First, bottom-up design. Second, designing with external references. Third, middle-out design. Fourth, top-down design. And finally, modular product architecture. Bottom-up design is probably the first technique that most people learn how to use, and actually they tend to learn how to do it when they are kids playing with different toys like Legos or Lincoln Logs. And the idea behind bottom-up design is that you create your individual parts, and then you take those parts and put them together into sub-assemblies, and then after you create your different sub-assemblies, you put them together into your top-level assembly. And when you're designing with bottom-up design, you are designing with local references only. You're not making any external references typically to other components in your model. And by not having external references, this gives you a high capacity in order to reuse those components in other assemblies. The problem with bottom-up design is as your products get more complex, as you get more components and you more, get more complex geometry, it can be difficult making changes because it requires you to open up each individual file as necessary in order to make those changes. And let's say that you're designing the housing for a component. You're going to have different mating interfaces and you want the surfaces to flow together. And if you're doing that with bottom up, it's hard to control that. The next technique that we'll take a look at is designing with external references. And this deals with some of the issues that you have with bottom-up design. And essentially, external references is bottom-up design incorporating external references. And you may make those external references through a variety of different means, such as data sharing features, like a copy geometry feature, or a shrink wrap feature, or a merge feature, or an inheritance feature. Other ways that people design with external references, and it's not as great, is by using copy and paste to copy surfaces and or edges from one part to another part. And probably the worst method of making external references is directly picking those external references from another part when you're making features in your target part. And some of the different ways in which that happens is by selecting a surface from another part as a sketch plane or a sketch reference or as you, when you're using the project or offset commands in sketch mode or a depth reference. And this is often used by people who aren't aware of the negative ramifications of designing with external references. It can create unwanted dependencies between parts. And if you don't retrieve those parts when you retrieve the component, then you can end up with failures or frozen references. And if you're doing designing with external references, I recommend this for assemblies with a minimal number of components in which it doesn't make sense to go the full-blown top-down design route. Middle out design is a technique that's typically used when you have a number of off the shelf components or if you have components that you are leveraging from pre existing designs. And primarily, you're designing a housing around those different components and then maybe routing wires and cables between them. So, typically, with middle out design, you start out with creating your top level assembly. And then you're going to create one or more sub-assemblies that have those previously defined components or commercial off-the-shelf or COTS components. And so you will place them. Sometimes that's referred to as packaging the different components. And then once you have all those predefined components placed, you will create a structural sub-assembly. And then you'll make a skeleton model in that structural sub-assembly and then use data sharing features in order to reference those previously placed components. And probably the easiest way to do that is with a shrink wrap feature because it will allow you to grab all the external services or the solid services of those previously placed components. 
And once you have your structural subassembly created with its skeleton, then you can make the different structural components. And then you can make other additional subassemblies as needed. Or you could place other components like your hardware and your fasteners. And typically, since you're dealing with electronic components, you're going to want to route wires and cables for power and for transmitting information between the different components. So in essence, middle out design ends up being a combination of bottom up and top down design. Speaking of top down design, this is probably the most effective way of building design intent into assemblies. And as the name applies, you start at the top level, in other words, at your product. And then you're going to lay out the product structure. In other words, you're going to figure out what subassemblies do I need at my top level? What subassemblies do I need in those subassemblies? What components, individual parts, do I need my subassemblies or at the top level? So, in essence, at the beginning, you are laying out your bill of materials. And with top down design, you're going to create central repositories of information at the top level and at different subassemblies as necessary. And what we're talking about here are things called notebooks. And notebooks look a lot like drawings, and they allow you to capture different dimensions and parameters that affect multiple components at the top level. And you can also write relations between those dimensions and parameters. So if one changes, the others change appropriately. Another important repository of information are skeleton models. And whereas notebooks contain dimensions and parameters, skeletons are going to contain important geometry that affects multiple components at the top level or the different subassemblies. In addition, skeletons can be used to locate components in your assemblies. Then we're going to use what are called data sharing features like copy geometry, shrink wrap, merge, inheritance, in order to, do, to communicate information from a skeleton model into a target component that you want to design features in. And a big aspect of top-down design is managing external references because there can be negative effects from designing with external references, such as creating circular references between your components, in which one component is both the parent and child of another component. And so top-down design is typically used when you have very complex assemblies. And what I mean by complex is that you have a large number of components. You might have complex geometry, again, typically with housings, and you have complex relationships between your different components in which changes to one should propagate changes to other models. And the idea behind top-down design is that you're putting more work up front creating these notebooks and skeletons, but then later on when you're trying to implement changes, that will be much easier because rather than opening up individual parts one by one, you can change the notebooks and the skeletons, and when you regenerate, those changes are propagated throughout your model. Now, one of the downsides of top-down design is that if you are using these data sharing features and connections to your skeletons and also declaring them to these different notebooks, that'll factor into your ability to reuse those components in other products. The last assembly design technique that we'll talk about is the modular product architecture. And this is typically used to support manufacturing strategies like assemble to order and configure to order in which you are creating variations based off of a common assembly. And this is often referred to as an overloaded bomb or overloaded bill of materials. You're going to create an assembly that's going to contain all the different variations of a particular component. For example, if you take a look down in the lower figure, we have a couple different motors that we could use in 
this particular motorbike. We have a couple different frames, and if your vision is good, you can see in the model tree of the upper figure that there are multiple different variations that we could have, say, for the frame or the different wheels. And so, modular product architecture is intended to allow you to configure figure your product sort of on the fly in order to pick and choose the different variants of components that you want to use. And in order to support this modular product architecture, you really should be desi designing with minimal external references between components. And you can use skeletons and that can help place the components in order to be able to swap out one for another depending on which choices that you make. If you're going to use skeletons for communicating geometry, you should only do that within an individual module. For example, you wouldn't want to have external references between the components that get swapped out and the top level assembly. Some of the different tools that you have in order to implement this in Creole Parametric include interchange assemblies, configurable modules and configurable products, and also pro program and family tables. And similarly to top-down design, this modular product architecture requires a lot of thinking and work up front, especially for figuring out the interfaces for swapping out one component with another component. Let's take a look at a few quick examples of these different assembly design strategies. Here is an example of top-down design. So I've got an assembly open and this represents a lathe, I believe, or CNC. And we have a just a few components inside of here. And if I, if I open up any of these individual components, and then go to my reference viewer, information reference viewer, we can see that there are no external references in this part. There are just a few features, and there's, they start off with one protrusion. Any other features in here reference other features in the model and no external components. The way that this assembly was created is they built the individual parts and then they started off with one part and assembled the other parts to them. And they can be assembled either with constraints like coincident, normal, parallel, distance, and so on, or with mechanism connections like pin, slider, and cylinder. Here is an example of designing with external references. We have an assembly just a few components. We have one part for the drill case. We have a second part, which is the mirrored version of that first component. And then we need to design the drill trigger that's going to go inside of here. So we have our drill trigger component. And if you take a look in the model tree, it has a couple of copy geometry features. These are data sharing features that grab the necessary reference from the components that are already in here, and then you could open up the part in its own separate window, and you have enough surface references that you can define the rest of the geometry for this component. So in this case over here, if you have a minimal number of components, it might not make sense to go the full-blown top-down design route in which you are going to create a skeleton model and you're going to lay out the geometry be to begin with. And another situation, let's say that we already had this part defined and we didn't need to repeat all the work inside of a skeleton model. Again, for a minimal number of components, it might not make sense to go with skeleton models. My rule of thumb is usually around 12 to 20 components. If I'm around that range, I might not go the skeleton route. Here is an example of our middle out design. We are designing a drone. We have a number of off-the-shelf components, such as a PixHawk flight computer, a power distribution board, a bunch of batteries. We have some sensors like our LiDAR and a camera, and we have a bunch of electronic speed controllers. And those are commercial off-the-shelf components. We want to design a drone around it, so we will place those different electronics that we already have, and then we can create our structural assembly. 
then we can create a skeleton model. And that skeleton model contains, uh, in this case here, it looks like a data sharing feature that's actually failing. If I regenerate, I might fix that. Uh, if we have our shrink wrap feature that is capturing a number of the external surfaces, and then inside of this structural subassembly, we could create the other components that are going to represent the housing and maybe the different panels and placement surfaces for where the components are going to go. And then we could end up creating additional subassemblies such as a cabling subassembly. Here is a go-kart assembly that was created with top-down design. If you take a look at the top of the model tree, there is a skeleton model. It's got some datum features in here that define some of the various different components in order to manage those relations and interdependencies between different parts. And this way, if we change the skeleton, then the placement and geometry in different components will update. This particular assembly is also driven by a notebook. And a notebook, again, is a special kind of model that's going to contain different dimensions that affect multiple components. For example, here you see it lays out the different dimensions for the frame and the seat and controls, suspension, so forth and so on. If I go to the relations dialog box, you can see that we have a number of different equations in here that control how changing one dimension is going to change another dimension. So again, this notebook is going to end up driving the different dimensions and parameters in multiple components, and we have our skeleton for driving the geometry. And be aware that this notebook can also drive skeleton geometry, so it's all connected. This motorbike is an example of modular product architecture. If you take a look in the model tree, first off, you might notice that the icon at the top of the model tree is different than a regular assembly icon. And we have a bunch of configurable modules inside of here. For example, we have a motor module. And if I were to open up this motor module in its open separate window, it actually has two different variants of an engine. Here's engine B. If I hide it, there you can see engine A. If I hide engine A and then bring back engine B, you can see that they are quite different. So different variants of the motorbike can have different engines. Let me bring that back. And let's go back to our motorbike window. In addition to having these different variants, we have these different tags that define what geometry is similar between the different components. And this helps us choose between the different variants in order to configure what kind of motorbike that we want. And if we take a look down here, there are also a couple different variants of the frame that we can use, a couple different variants of the rear arm. And you can also have some standard components. For example, here is a standard uh, assembly for the rear shock. Here is a standard part for the headlights components and a standard assembly for the muffler. But the other ones are these different configurable modules where we can pick and choose which components we want to have inside of here. Thank you very much. For more information, please visit www.creowindchill.com. If you learned something in this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like this video, please click the subscribe button to be informed when new videos are uploaded. Thank you very much.